I am Professor Aziz Rahman and today I am going to present this special lecture because of the relevance with Ramadan. You know millions of people they have diabetes and many of them they would like to fast and this lecture would help you understand how these medicines are better used and how we can optimize them during the month of Ramadan so that these individuals, these patients with diabetes, they can fast safely. So the topic is optimization of anti-diabetic medication during Ramadan. And I have to make a few disclaimers. First of one is that most of these guidelines are based on evidence and are expert opinions. So you can follow them with confidence uh, and of course there will be situations where you will have to make some amendments in these guidelines but mostly they will be relevant and applicable in most patients and I have used some trade names only for better orientation better understanding and not for any monetary gains because some of the newer drugs uh, they are well known with their trade name since the audience uh, the target audience of this lecture is not only medical students or postgraduate students uh, the target or audience also includes practicing family physicians uh, so I thought that I would use trade names in some cases because they prescribe drugs with their trade names so they can better understand and apply these concepts Fasting is patient choice. We of course cannot tell anybody to fast or otherwise uh, But if somebody wishes to fast and he is or she is diabetic Then we have to make certain changes in the medication so that the fasting remains safe for his health So with these two a uh, few disclaimers we are going to start with the presentation and what are the physiological changes which occur due to prolonged fasting and because of these physiological changes body has to face few challenges and one of them is prolonged food deprivation now in normal days we hardly uh, stop eating for women there are hardly periods of uh, food deprivation for more than few hours but during Ramadan, you cannot eat or drink for 16, 17, 18 hours. So this is a major physiological challenge for the body. Then change in meal timings. Our typical meal timings are different. But in Ramadan, we have to take a very early meal, which is called Sahri. And then we have to take early dinner, which is called Iftari. So these timings are different. That is another challenge for the body. Then change in the meal composition is also a challenge because uh, the meal for Sahari is different than our usual breakfast and meal at Aftari is also very different than our usual dinner. Uh, there's a lot of carbs and there's a lot of fats in that and there's a lot of fried food. So that is another challenge. And then the change in circadian rhythm. You know our body metabolism is linked with our sleep pattern also. Now in many cultures during Ramadan a sleep pattern changes completely. But even in uh, I mean if, even if there is not complete change there is significant change in our sleep pattern. So that change in circadian rhythm also have some metabolic implications. So if our body fails to meet these challenges well, then there are certain risks. What are those risks? The major risk is that of hypoglycemia. If somebody is not going to eat for 16 hours, and especially if that patient is on glucose lowering therapy, there is definite risk of hypoglycemia during the day, especially uh, in the afternoon because that is a time when sugar will be dropping and patient will not take his lunch and there is a serious risk of hypoglycemia as you all know 
uh, when we treat diabetes, we are mostly concerned about hyperglycemia, but hyperglycemia uh, can cause damage in, in years and decades, whereas hypoglycemia can cause sometimes irreversible damage within minutes. So we just can't take the chance of hypoglycemia. So I think one major objective of uh, making changes in the medication in diabetes prior to Ramadan is to prevent hypoglycemia. Then dehydration, of course, when you're not drinking water and especially when there's a, a summer weather, so there is the risk of developing dehydration also. Then hyperglycemia also, uh, typically we take uh, aftari which is uh, very rich in carbs and patient feel justified to drink uh, sugary uh, uh, drinks also uh, and also take many things which are rich in carbohydrates and if patient takes medication after the meal there is a risk of hyperglycemia after aftari also so we have to prevent that also because severe hyperglycemia can be damaging also then in some rare cases there is a risk of ketoacidosis now luckily this risk is very low although it is potentially serious condition so we will be concerned about this risk of ketoacidosis so out of these four risks i think the major risk is that of hypoglycemia so we will talk about hypoglycemia in little more detail uh, so primary objective is to prevent hypoglycemia and also severe hyperglycemia and I think if we say that we would like to prevent both hypoglycemia and even modest hyperglycemia most probably we will not be able to succeed so I think if our objective is more realistic we must prevent hypoglycemia but if we are able to prevent severe hyperglycemia I think the purpose will be solved so modest hyperglycemia for a short period for only 30 days perhaps would not be much damaging because whenever we try to prevent hyperglycemia there is risk of hypoglycemia so that is our objective and that is uh, the basic of uh, uh, be that is the reason why we have made these recommendations the risk of hypoglycemia is not the same in every individual with diabetes. Now, there are two main factors. One is patient himself, the profile of the patient. I will just uh, show you various uh, factors related to the patient which may uh, predispose him to hypoglycemia. Then there is a there are factors which are related to the medication patient is taking. There are certain drugs which are much less likely to cause hypoglycemia as compared to others which are more likely to cause hypoglycemia. In normal life we use them because uh, when patient is allowed to eat or drink in case of hypoglycemia then uh, hypoglycemia cannot be uh, then it is not that major risk. So during Ramadan because patients would pro most probably try to avoid breaking his fast so we would like to avoid these medications which are more likely to cause hypoglycemia. Now the factors related to patient, previous history of hypoglycemia. If somebody has uh, never experienced uh, uh, hypoglycemia in the past, it is less likely that he or she would have hypoglycemia during Ramadan also. But another person who has been having hypoglycemia frequently otherwise also is at greater risk. A patient who has a tighter control. Now this is simple logic or simple common sense. Somebody's sugar remains very high. So the chances of hypoglycemia is much less as com compared to another person whose sugar is very well controlled. So the same person whose sugar is very well controlled uh, and when he starts fasting there is a risk of hypoglycemia. Then renal disease kidneys have very very important role in glucose homeostasis after liver kidney is the main organ which causes gluconeogenesis in case of hypoglycemia and that mechanism may be impaired if somebody has renal disease which many patients diabetes may have minus 
CKD1 or 2 where actually kidney functions are well preserved. Other patients who have CKD3, 4 and 5, they would be at particular risk of hypoglycemia. Liver disease, again, liver disease is common in our society because of hepatitis C and B. Now, liver disease, when I say liver disease, I actually mean cirrhosis. Uh, fatty liver is also liver disease. A fatty liver would not cause much of an issue, but if somebody has chronic liver disease and that also decompensated cirrhosis, that would definitely be a major factor in the pathogenesis of hypoglycemia because liver is the main organ which fights hypoglycemia by producing glucose, the mechanism of gluconeogenesis and glycogen lysis. Then frailty, somebody who is very, very frail, elderly, without much of uh, body reserve, much without much of glycogen reserve and fat reserve, that person, person is also at a greater risk of hypoglycemia. Now, when we talk about medication, there are two groups of medication which are particularly responsible for hypoglycemia. One is insulin. Insulin, of course, insulin, the main function of insulin is to lower glucose. If somebody is taking insulin, particularly the one with which are uh, which have a peak mechanism, the profile is is not very flat. They have a peak action, like human insulins and NPH insulins. They are likely to cause hypoglycemia. In fact, basal insulin and uh, rapid acting insulin analogs can also cause hypoglycemia, but chances are relatively less. Then secretogogs. So secretogogs are the drugs which stimulate beta cell to produce insulin. And the main example is uh, sulfonylureas. We have some other drugs also which cause, uh, which which stimulate beta cell, but their mechanism of action is uh, glucose dependent. I'm shortly going to talk about them in more detail. But here, I usually uh, secretogog uh, refers to sulfonylureas. Because sulfonyl ureas, they stimulate beta cell to produce insulin, even if somebody's existing glucose level is normal. So insulin will lower sugar further. Many other medicine, they do not cause uh, hypoglycemia uh, uh, commonly. Now, we can classify anti-diabetic anti drugs into three classes. Now, this classification is based on uh, the potential of causing hypoglycemia. We can classify into those which have low risk of hypoglycemia and those which have high risk of causing hypoglycemia, then those which have moderate risk of causing hypoglycemia. Let's first talk about the low risk hypoglycemia classes. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with these drugs, metformin, SGLT2 inhibitors, a carbose, thiazolidine diones, TZDs, DPP4 inhibitors, and GLP1 receptor agonists. All these drugs they have low potential of causing hypoglycemia. Now, if I ask you what is common between these four drugs, these are this is a very, very diverse group. They are pharmacologically different their mechanism of action is different but i have grouped them in one uh, based on their one unique feature and that unique feature is that these drugs they lower glucose but they do not stimulate beta cells since they do not stimulate beta cells they do not produce insulin and uh, they work through different mechanisms for example metformin works by improving insulin resistance in the tissues and by also suppressing gluconeogenesis in the liver. SGLT2 inhibitors, they work through kidneys. They uh, promote excretion of glucose, not affecting uh, beta cell. A-carbose works through the gut. It slows down the absorption of glucose. And thiazolidine diones, they work on liver. They improve glucose resistance. They also work on the fat cells. So all these drugs, they have 
affect outside beta cells. I think one simple rule is that if there is any anti-diabetic drug which does not stimulate beta cells is less likely to cause hypoglycemia. So this is one group. Then the second, what do you think is common between these two groups? GLP-1 receptor agonists, they are the drugs which actually stimulate beta cells but in a glucose dependent pattern. That means beta cell stimulation will halt once glucose level become normal. So it is a secretagogue but since the action is glucose dependent, the potential of causing hypoglycemia is much less than sulfonylurea. DPP-4 inhibitors are the drugs which uh, prevent uh, uh, degradation of our, of our endogenous GLP. So they also have effect which is glucose dependent. So all these drugs, they have low risk of causing uh, hypoglycemia. Now let's talk about this group uh, with, who, with the, the, the group which has got high risk of or high potential of causing hypoglycemia. Old generation sulfonylureas. The only example of this class which is in practice which is used is glybenclamide. Now this drug is very commonly used and this drug is incredibly cheap and incredibly effective so it is very very popular. And many people are using, but this is actually very long acting drugs. And many times it is prescribed twice a day. The action is more than 24 hours. Now, if it is taken twice a day, then there will be cumulative action in the body, particularly if there is a kidney disease in the background. So, glybenclamide is very notorious to cause prolonged and problematic hypoglycemia, even in non-fasting state. So I think this is a drug which has got, I would classify it as a uh, high potential of hypoglycemia. Then intermediate acting insulins which are called NPH because the profile of this, these insulin is with a peak. So the time which corresponds with the peak, that is a time when there is a risk of hypoglycemia. Pre, excuse me. So the pre-mixed uh, uh, human insulin because they also mostly contain NPH and because of the NPH component there is a risk of hypoglycemia 6, 7, 8 hours after injection and because of the human insulin there is a risk of hypoglycemia 2 or 3 hours after injection. So I think this is uh, the group of drugs which have a relatively high risk, high potential of causing hypoglycemia. Now let's talk about those drugs which have moderate risk of hypoglycemia. Uh, this have already highlighted. Uh, now let's move on to moderate risk of. So newer generation sulfonylureas, for example, glimepiride or glycolazide (MR). These drugs they are sulfonylureas, but their action is somehow uh, less pronounced less marked as compared to glibenclamide and there is evidence that these drugs actually they have lesser potential of causing hypoglycemia. Then basal insulin. There are insulins which have very very flat profile and I'll show you they have less risk of causing, causing hypoglycemia and then we now have combinations of basal insulin with GLP receptor agonist combination they would also be classified as having moderate risk. Now, based on this concept, we have two groups now. Those patients who have maximum risk of ha having hypoglycemia, a vulnerable patient, I just described some factors related to the patient, if those factors are present, Plus that person is on medication which has high potential of causing hypoglycemia, this patient uh, would be called high risk patient. And on the other hand, we have a patient who have minimum risk of hypoglycemia, less vulnerable patient, a patient who has normal liver, normal kidney and is otherwise healthy, relatively young person that is less prone to develop hypoglycemia plus that person is on medication which also has low potential of causing hypoglycemia. So there would be 
minimum risk. But of course, there would be different grades and shades. For example, a vulnerable patient taking low potential medication or less vulnerable patient taking high potential medicine, they would have intermediate risk. So I think in every individual, we need to define the risk and accordingly we make a plan for him. Now I'm going to uh, present 20 different recommendations which are agreed upon by Pakistan Society of Internal Medicine and they are also actually agreed upon by uh, Pakistan Academy of Family Physicians. So I'm going to present them one by one. Recommendation number one is that all patients should see their doctors two to four weeks before Ramadan to have their medication adjusted. So this is, I think, highly desirable because patient would not be able to judge if he or she is in that group where there is a high risk of hypoglycemia. So it is best that if they see their doctor, the doctor may say that the same medication will be continued or the doctor may suggest some medication. So this is recommendation number one. The recommendation number two is about those people who are taking metformin as monotherapy. Metformin may be taken twice a day, 500 milligram, 750 milligram, 850 milligram or 1 gram twice a day. So no change is necessary because metformin has got very low potential of causing hypoglycemia. Those patients who are taking metformin XR formulation is a slow release, long acting formulation once a day. I think it is best if they take once a day medication at iftar. So that will be safer. Then if somebody is taking metformin three times a day, a 500 milligram or 750 milligram or 850 milligram three times a day, in that case, uh, I think first step is that the morning dose can be given at Sahri and the afternoon and night dose can be combined and given at Aftari. Now this is an example. Somebody was on metformin 500 milligram three times a day with each meal that you can change it to 500 milligram at Sahri and 1000 milligram which is actually afternoon and night dose combined at Aftari. So this, this will be very very convenient and patient will not have any problem and he will be able to fast safely. So this was a recommendation number two for those who are on metformin monotherapy. Our recommendation three is about those people who are taking DPP-4 inhibitors as monotherapy. And we have citagliptin, which is available with the name of Genuvia and Trivia, which are many others. And it is 100 milligram uh, once a day or 50 milligram twice a day. And the other one which is common and available in our country is Vildagliptin and the brand name is Galvis and Galvis is typically prescribed as 50 milligram twice a day. Uh, and then we very recently had linagliptin with the name of uh, Linvesta and the dosage is 5 milligram once a day. So if any person is taking any of these drugs as monotherapy, the recommendation is that there is no, uh, no changes necessary because as monotherapy, DPP-4 inhibitors have low potential of causing hypoglycemia. Now metformin and DPP-4 combination. This is very very popular combination. In fact this is my favorite also because metformin has effect on fasting sugar and DPP-4 inhibitors have main effect on the postprandial sugar and both drugs have common features of uh, weight neutrality and also not the potential of causing hypoglycemia. The pharmacokinetics matches each with each other very well. So very commonly these drugs are prescribed as combo pills and typically twice a day. For example, citagliptin metformin combo is called Genumet or Triviamet. There are many other names and the typical dosage is 50 by 1000 milligram given twice a day. Similarly, Vildagliptin and Metformin is also given twice a day. We have Galvis Met or Vilget and typical dosage is 50 by 500, 
50 by 850 or 50 by 1000 that is also given twice a day. Now we have already discussed that no change is necessary in metformin and we have already dis discussed that no change is, is necessary in DPP-4 inhibitors. So it is only logical that if somebody is taking these drugs, no change will be necessary. So patient can take, continue to take these drugs as monotherapy. But if somebody is taking cetagliptin metformin XR formulation and that is given once a day and I normally prescribe this once a day medication with dinner uh, but if somebody is taking it in the morning I think it is recommended that that person should take it with the thar, uh, during Rafta, uh, during month of Ramadan. So this is the recommendation of recommendation 4 for those people who are on metformin and DPP4 combination. Let's move to the next recommendation now. This is about SGLT2 inhibitors with or without citagliptin. Now, SGLT2 inhibitors, they work through kidneys. They promote glucose excretion. So whenever glucose is excreted, there is some diuresis also. But surprisingly, uh, every person does not have diuresis. Uh, there are people because it has got multiple actions actually SGLT2 inhibitors have multiple mechanism of action and we have noticed that every person does not have significant diuresis but the recommendation is actually based on the fact whether or not somebody has diuresis with these drugs or not. The common names are DAPA gliflozin. Uh, we have DAPA, we have Ziga. I am sure there are many other names also. Typical dosage is 5 mg or 10 mg once a day. Then we have empagliflozin which is diampa or jardi and there are many other names. The dosage is 10 mg or 25 mg once a day. Then we have ertigliflozin which is now recently made available and we also have ertigliflozin combined with cetaglibrin which is available with the name of trivia R2. So recommendation about these medicine is that they may be continued but switch to aftari, particularly if significant diuresis. It, be, it is, I think, uh, it would depend on persons, uh, if that person complains of diuresis, uh, then I recommend that the medication should be taken as aftari because uh, long hours of water deprivation in summer month when there is going to be sweating also, so it would be best if these drugs are taken at aftari so that patient can drink water uh, before uh, next sari and I think that is the recommendation. But if somebody does not have significant diuresis with these medication, that person can continue to take the medication the way that person was taking before uh, in the morning or at night or whatever time. Sometimes it is given twice a day also. So uh, whatever time that patient is taking, that person may continue. Now, this recommendation is about SGLT2 inhibitors and metformin combination. As I said, DPP-4 inhibitors and metformin combination is very popular. SGLT2 inhibitors and metformin combination has also become very popular because both pair very well, both lowers glucose in a very decent way and without causing hypoglycemia, without promoting any weight gain. They have different mechanism of action and so the metformin most probably uh, uh, the main action is in the fasting sugar. SGLT2 inhibitors would have action most importantly in the postprandial but also in the fasting state. So what are the recommendations? These are actually some of the combinations available. Dapagliflozin with metformin is available with the name of Dapamet and Zigamet. And empagliflozin with the metformin, the famous names are diampa M and Jardimet. And I think these medicines can be continued as such if there is no significant diuresis. And if somebody does have some diuresis, you could continue the same dosage at night, but in the morning dose, you could take out this SGLT2 inhibitors. Maybe you can. Uh, ask the patient to take metformin alone uh, with the sahri uh, uh, and because during the day patient would not then develop dehydration. 
so this is i think based on common sense uh, especially the fast is going to be long and the, there's a uh, season the summer season so i think uh, that is uh, it is possible uh, it is recommended that patients should take it at a time Thiazolotine dione drugs, they were very popular, they still are very very useful uh, as a monotherapy, they are not very commonly prescribed but some people are taking as monotherapy or with other drugs and they, the examples in our country are pioglitazone, piozer and zolid. Recommendation is that they have no problem and they do not cause hypoglycemia. So whatever dose patient is taking 15 milligram or uh, 30 milligram or 45 milligram, which is the maximum recommended dose, whatever dose patient is taking in the morning or at night, patient may continue during Ramadan also. So this is recommendation number seven. Recommendation number eight is for those who are taking bioglitazone with metformin. You must have noticed that we have many combination with metformin. So metformin with pioglitazone is another uh, combination which is prescribed. Piozer plus and Zolid plus. These are two drugs which are used. Uh, I think recommendation since we have already said metformin does not require any modification. Pioglitazone does not uh, require any modification. So combination will also be continued as such during Ramadan. Uh, so the morning dose will be taken with Sahri and afternoon dose and the night dose will be taken with Aftari. So otherwise no changes and no reduction in dosage is required. So this was recommendation number eight. Recommendation number nine is about those who are taking alpha glucosidase inhibitor. Now these drugs they actually uh, prevent glucose absorption or at least slows down glucose absorption uh, after the meal from the gut uh, and these drugs are known not to cause hypoglycemia in any situation and the only example we have is a, a glucose patient may be taking 50 milligram twice a day or three times a day ideally these medicines are to be taken with every uh, main meal so if we normally take three meals so if the patient is taking 50 milligram with three meals the recommendation is that if somebody is taking twice a day no change will be necessary patient will take morning dose with sari and, and the night dose with artari and this drug has to be taken with meal and afternoon dose will be dropped since there will be no meal in the afternoon so that will be dropped Sulfonyl ureas, I think this is where uh, some uh, uh, changes would be needed. This is the recommendation number 10. First recommendation is that glybinclamide, very famous drug, very popular drug called Danil. It is very famous and popular because it is one of the oldest sulfonyl ureas. And number two, it is very, very potent and it is very cheap. So many people in our country, they are taking as monotherapy or in combination with metformin. When it is combined with metformin, it is called glucovans. So it is recommended that these drugs, uh, glabinclamide as a monotherapy or glabinclamide combined with glucovans should be avoided during Ramadan because it has got high potential of causing hypoglycemia. Then in newer generation sulfonylureas, glimepiride, amaryl or getril are the famous names or glycolazide, dimacron MR is another popular name. So in combination with metformin like amaryl MSR 1 or 2 and getformin 1 or 2 can be taken once daily at aftari. So since they have less chances of causing hypoglycemia as compared to older generation, they can be taken but it is recommended that they, since they are sulfonylureas, they should be taken as once a day medication at aftari, not with sari. So this is the recommendation number 10. If patient is taking any sulfonylurea twice a day, then morning dose should be reduced to half or skipped completely to avoid any hypoglycemia during the day.
Now this is recommendation number 11. This is about GLP-1 recept receptor agonists. Uh, so these drugs are available with the name of liraglutide injection form once a day. The train name is Victoza. And then we have dulaglutide, which is once a week. The train name is Trulicity. And now we also have semaglutide that once a week, the train name is Ozempic. Now these medicine actually once a week and in a fixed dose, you can't really make any adjustment. And in fact, and no adjustment is needed as these drugs do not cause hypoglycemia. There are at least they have very low potential of causing hypoglycemia because their stimulatory action on beta cell and uh, also the inhibitory action on glucagon, the alpha cell is glucose dependent. So that is why uh, these drugs can be continued. In fact, GLP-1 receptor agonist will perhaps be the best during Ramadan because they control your uh, appetite. So perhaps fasting will be easier for those who are taking GLP-1 receptor agonist. We of course cannot prescribe these drugs for this reason only, but if somebody is already on these medication without any changes, patient can continue to fast. Basal insulins. Now basal insulins are those which have flat profile without a peak. The famous names are Glargine. Uh, the train names are Lentus, Tojio. Tojio is actually the same, only a concentrated form of Lentus and Bezagene, which is our local brand of Glargine. And then we have Detimid, which is uh, Levimid and these are basal insulin and so recommendation is that in pre-Ramadan evaluation we should check patients fasting sugar if somebody's fasting sugar is usually 120 or above then same dose may be continued of course if it is very high then you would require you would need to adjust it but if somebody's fasting sugar is above 120 uh, there is no much risk of hypoglycemia if patient continue to take the same dosage of basal insulin during month of Ramadan. But if somebody's fasting sugar is less, less than 120, it is recommended that you should reduce basal insulin by 20%. Now, how do we do that? This is a very simple way. Every calculator have this function. If somebody is taking 30 units, so you uh, you subtract 20%, 30 minus 20, then percent mark, then equal to 24. So if somebody was taking 30 units, uh, whatever time in the morning or at night, uh, typically basal insulins are given at night. So that dosage has to be reduced from 30 to 24 to avoid daytime hypoglycemia. So this is the adjustment. Recommendation number 13 is about patients who are taking basal insulin and GLP-1 receptor agonists. This combination has also become popular amongst the injectable therapy. Now, insulin will take care of fasting sugar basal insulin and GLP-1 receptor agonists will take care of postprandial glucose and both can be combined and both are injectable. They can be taken as one single injection. Uh, examples are insulin degrudec and liraglutide. The train name is Zoltofi. And then we have insulin glargine with lixisanatide. The train name is Soliqua. So these drugs, the, the recommendation is exactly the same as for basal insulin because we have already discussed the GLP-1 receptor agonists, they do not require any changes in the dosage at all. So whatever changes are needed, it is for the basal insulin. And for basal insulin, only in the last slide we discussed, if fasting sugar is 120 milligram or more, same dose to be continued. If fasting sugar is 120 or less, then we have to reduce it by 20%. Further adjustments can be made on following days.
then NPH and NPH base pre mixolin insulin. NPH is the insulin which is like intermediate uh, duration action and it has got a peak. Uh, 7 to 8 hours after injection, it would have a peak. So, if this insulin is injected in the morning, it is possible that it would cause hypoglycemia in the afternoon. And in the pre mixed insulin, uh, these are the example. Again, there is a risk of hypoglycemia when there is a peak effect. These are the names uh, humulin N, insulatard, insuget N, humulin 7030, mixtard 30, insuget 7030. These are the common insulins which are based on NPH. They are either these three are NPH alone, these three are NPH with human insulin. So it is recommended that NPH mono and all NPH containing combos should not be taken at Sehri. They may be uh, taken at Aftari but not at Sehri because if you take it at Aftari then the peak effect will be before next Sehri and that is the time when patient is allowed to eat so there is no risk of hypoglycemia. Now fast acting analog based pre mixed insulin humolog mix 25 or 50 novo mix 30 or 50 and usual morning dose can be taken at aftari and half of the evening dose may be injected at sehri now i will give you an example to clarify what i actually mean to say Suppose there was somebody who was on Humalog Mix 25 or Novo Mix 30 and he or she was taking 30 units morning and 20 units night. So this is an example. The recommendation is that this morning dose 30 units can be taken at Aftari and half of this evening dose which would be 10 units can be taken at Sahari. So this is what is, uh, uh, but that is what we do. 10 units at Sahari and 30 units at Aftari. Since these insulins are injected immediately before meal, so they are definitely more suitable as compared to human insulin combinations for Ramadan because they are to be injected half an hour before meal. So these analogs are definitely safer and better and more flexible uh, during Ramadan. Then short acting human insulin and we have humulin R uh, since it is short acting it is typically given three times a day with uh, 30 minutes before each meal Actrapid and Insuget R. R are given 30 minutes before each meal and if we take three meals a day then it would be three times a day. Now recommendation is that afternoon, afternoon dose would be of course dropped because afternoon meal is dropped and morning dose reduced by 20%. Why? Because these short acting insulin, they have some problem. Uh, their action is like five hours, six hours. And if you've taken a small sari, there is the risk of hypoglycemia uh, after three or four hours. So I think it is best that we reduce morning dose by 20%. And the uh, evening dose, pre-Ramadan dose may be continued at Aftari. If somebody was taking like uh, 12 units three times a day, uh, morning 12 units will be reduced to I think maybe eight and the night 12 units will be uh, continued as such and afternoon 12 units will be dropped. This was recommendation number 16. The recommendation number 17 is about those people who are taking fast acting insulin analogs. Now fast acting insulin analogs are technically better than uh, short acting insulin, uh, short acting human insulins because once injected they do not make hexamers and the action starts immediately so they can be very conveniently taken immediately before meal. So I think they are definitely uh, safer for uh, fasting. Humolog TDS, Novorapid TDS and Epidra TDS. These are all uh, fast acting. This is insulin Lispro, this is insulin Aspart, 
this is insulin blue lysine these are all uh, fast acting insulins and their action start fast and their duration of action is also short so the chances of hypoglycemia are much less afternoon dose of course will be dropped because there will be no meal at that time and morning and evening dose pre ramadan can be continued the same dosage at sahri and iftari that there is a different recommendation for uh, short acting because short acting human insulin should be reduced morning dose should be reduced by 20% but fast acting insulin human uh, uh, fast acting insulin analogs can be continued the same dosage now if somebody is taking uh, uh, the other type human um, combination i think insulin analogs since they are technically superior to human analogs consider switching if affordability is not an issue insulin analogs are technically better but significantly more expensive than uh, human insulin so if patient can comfortably uh, afford i'm sure many patient would be willing to spend some extra money to experience a safe uh, fasting so i think uh, you should make this offer same dosage which patient was taking can be changed with insulin analog based uh, combos or mods this was recommendation number 17 now recommendation 18 is about how frequently and when we should monitor glucose uh, uh, particularly patient on sulfonylureas or insulin because these are the classes of drug which have a relatively high potential of causing of hypoglycemia and so i think particularly in these patient but i believe in every patient there should be some monitoring so blood sugar random be checked in the afternoon around 3ish 3ish 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the afternoon or whenever there are symptoms suggestive of hypoglycemia now based on value we can take certain actions if sugar is more than 130 at 3 pm then no immediate action is needed because 130 is safe and same dose may be continued in subsequent uh, fasting and if the sugar value is less than 100 uh, blood sugar be monitored hourly from that time onward till the time of iftari and from the next day i suggest that the dosage should be reduced by 20% uh, so whatever medication especially if patient is taking insulin then there should be some reduction in medicine if patient is taking oral medication i think there should be some reduction in dosage of whatever patient takes in the morning uh, maybe you can half it because 100 is at the verge of hypoglycemia and it is only 3 pm we still have 3 to 4 hours and then there is a possibility of hypoglycemia so next uh, from next uh, uh, day i think you should reduce the dosage and if somebody's sugar is less than 70 that patient has got technically hypoglycemia so it is recommended that the patient should break his fast and he should consume food and from next day onward you must reduce insulin by 20% at least or if patient is taking oral medication you should reduce it to half now let me say one thing there are people there are people who have no symptoms of hypoglycemia at 70 or even at 60 now if this is patient choice to continue to fast they may be allowed to do so but then you will actually check his sugar or you ask him to check his sugar hourly so if it drops further then i think it is best to break fast then patient can of course keep another fast uh, in non uh, fasting month so i think to, to compensate so this is the recommendation about glucose monitoring and this is concerning hypoglycemia and the next slide is about hyperglycemia recommendation number 19 so if somebody's blood sugar random at 3 pm is 350 mg or more or between 200 mg and 350 mg with symptoms maybe vague symptom undue fatigue severe lethargy uh, restlessness i think you must check ketones 
this much of glucose may not give much of damage but if there is ketones then there could be a significant problem if the ketone in the urine or if the serum ketone level is elevated or the ketones are present in the urine patient must be uh, asked to break fast because then there is a risk of uh, diabetic ketoacidosis progressing to a more serious level break uh, breakfast should be uh, broken no sorry this fast should be broken and patient should be given intravenous insulin and iv saline because we are dealing with potentially serious condition uh, and if the ketones are negative sugar is high 350 and the ketones are negative then you can be assured that there is no immediate risk then patient can continue his fast but from the next day onward you should adjust the medication titrate them upwards so that next day patient does not develop that much of hyperglycemia now if patient develops ketones you will of course give him immediate treatment then you should also make a joint decision with patient whether or not patient should continue fasting because uh, I think this patient would require maybe few days to come up with another better plan so it would be perfectly understandable if patient is instructed not to fast for two days till his sugar is in a safe limit so this was a recommendation number 19 now recommendation of 20 is about those people uh, who should not fast or who should at least consult their doctors and ask if it is safe for them to fast as I said in the beginning it is actually the patient's choice even if patient is at high risk of developing hypoglycemia in fasting and patient wants to fast it is his choice we must respect his choice but we must do our part to make it safe for him if he wants to, if he prefers to if he opts to fast type 1 diabetes patient because type 3 type 1 diabetes often need frequent insulin injection and frequent feeding pregnancy patient already have uh, a stressful condition and then uh, fasting would be a little tricky ckd4 and 5 especially those patients who are on, on renal replacement therapy dialysis i think it would be risky for them to fast decompensated chronic liver disease somebody with cirrhosis and ascites portal hypertension heart failure new york heart association class c and four those patients who have dyspnea or orthopnea uh, and then any disease requiring frequent medication somebody is asthmatic he has to take medication sometimes frequently somebody has epilepsy or whatever reason if med frequent medication is needed then any patient who is too unwell for whatever reason or frankly uncontrolled diabetic patient all these patients must consult their doctors number one first to ask if it is safe or if it is not safe and if they still uh, opt to fast then significant changes would be needed i think these patients have to remain in constant contact with their doctors throughout ramadan to have safe fasting experience so these were 20 different recommendations made by pakistan society of internal medicine summary of my presentation is <clears throat> to fast or not to fast remains patient choice and we must respect his choice uh, we just have to make their fasting safe the primary aim of medication adjustment is to prevent hypoglycemia and severe hyperglycemia some degree of hyperglycemia after aftari and after sari would have to be accepted to avoid hypoglycemia then pre-ramadan evaluation is recommended for all but is essential for some and the list I showed and in, in the in recommendation number 20 those patients who are at a particularly high risk of developing hypoglycemia they must see their doctors and have the proper adjustment in the medication and they must remain in contact with their doctor throughout fasting month but others should also see uh, I think their doctors unless they themselves are empowered with knowledge and they know 
the medication they are taking is safe. And the medicines with low potential of causing hypoglycemia are preferred. And I have given you the list. I can repeat it. Metformin, uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists, DPP-4 inhibitors, SGLT-2 inhibitors, A-carbos, uh, thiazolone D dions. These are drugs which have low potential of causing hypoglycemia. Then basal insulins and modern uh, sulfonylurea, slow release sulfonylureas, they have moderate risk. And glibenclamide and uh, NPH based insulin have, have high potential of causing hypoglycemia. Glibenclamide and glibenclamide metformin combination should be avoided during Ramadan. And NPH and NPH based combination should be avoided or at least avoided at Sahari. And basal insulin, patients who are on basal insulin or basal insulin plus uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists, they should have their sugar tested before the month of Ramadan. If it is more than 120, they may continue the same dosage. If it is less than 120, they are instructed to reduce their uh, dosage, uh, basal insulin dosage by 20%. Consider switching to insulin analog if affordability is not an issue. Those patients who are on NPH or NPH based premixed insulin or they are um, those patients who are taking uh, uh, human insulins or human insulin and NPH combos, you can I think consider switching them to analog based uh, combos because technically these drugs are uh, safer uh, but they're slightly expensive but i think this extra cost most patient would be able to afford uh, to have a safe uh, fasting experience individual adjustment will still be needed as every human is different and patients should be empowered to make minor adjustments. Many times we make adjustments and recommendation purely based on common sense. And many patients with diabetes, they have developed that skill. So I think they should be empowered to make some changes in their medication on day to day basis also, especially if they are on insulin. So this has been Professor Azizur Rahman. And these were the recommendation uh, approved by Pakistan Society of Internal Medicine. And I am here from Madistan. Uh, you can learn more on this channel where this lecture is available and many other lectures about diabetes and all topics in internal medicine are available. I am looking forward to see you there. But these recommendations are also published in the current issue of Journal of Pakistan Society of Internal Medicine. You can have full access on this website, psimj.com. You will have an, a, a Word format documentation, a document um, uh, giving all these recommendations.